So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to give you a sneak peek at our brand new activity and guide on evolutionary trees. So my name and is just as yeah. a just as a forward, we're going to be recording this. So um, if you do not want to be on camera, um, just have that as a note. Thank you, Allison. So my name is uh, Abby Thompson, and I work for the Stanford Genetics Department, where I'm the Director of Educational Outreach. So I work quite closely with the bio team at the Tech to design and develop new experiences in our bio tinkering lab. Uh, and I'm Caitlin Yellen. I'm the Life Sciences Experience Developer uh, at the Tech Interactive. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to be introducing you to our new classroom activity, which is evolutionary trees. Um, as a reminder, like Allison said, we are recording this. Uh, so if you're going to turn your camera on, uh, we are recording this uh, session so that we can share it later. So today we're going to run over some of the core concepts and mechanics of our new evolutionary trees activity. Um, we'll uh, uh, take you through some of the main steps and parts, uh, talk about a few extensions uh, that you can use this, ways you can incorporate this into your classroom and uh, other ways that you can use this with your, either your students in distance learning or with your existing content. All right, and before we dive totally into the activity, I wanted to give you a little bit about, of context of how we think about genetics, uh, specifically at the tech. So as you probably already know, genetics is a powerful technology and design medium, which is transforming a wide range of different industries. Genetic technologies are propelling innovation in all sorts of fields, ranging from you know, areas like healthcare, um, especially in the field of personalized medicine, things like food production, there's all sorts of new crops, um, especially made with genetically modified um, organisms. Conservation biology uses a lot of genetic techniques, especially for management of animal populations and many other different diverse fields. And what all this means is that new careers tend to be interdisciplinary. They range from traditional laboratory roles, such as in this image on the top, um, to field work, to pure com computer analysis and coding, people who never set foot in a lab at all. So we really like to think about how can we engage and equip diverse different people to navigate this new landscape. So at the tech, um, we approach this mainly through authentic science learning. So this includes emphasizing the collaborative nature of science, highlighting interdisciplinary connections wherever possible. And we also have as one of our most common themes, emphasizing genetics as a way to solve problems, which is mainly what we'll be showing you today. Usually these are problems that don't have a predefined correct answer, but instead invite students to come up with creative solutions that may be different than they expected. Um, and overall, we try to emphasize creativity. So while many science classes tend to be memorization heavy, real science is of course very creative. Creativity is a critically important skill for scientists. Scientists explore and investigate um, topics that aren't very well understood. And scientists often have to come up with entirely new ways to think about and research uh, a new problem. Um, so we really like to emphasize this as a core part of how science works. At the Tech, we have eight different activities that we run in person with visitors to the museum. They range from solving a crime with forensic genetics, to making a necklace with your own DNA, to exploring what DNA can tell us about ancient people who lived thousands of years ago. So what we're going to be talking about today are some of the ways we're bringing this into the classroom. So our biology team is taking our activities that we run in person and turning them into tools for you to use. Our first release was algae string, which uses polymers made by algae as the core of an open-ended exploration of biodegradable polymers. Um, you can find those resources available on, uh, on our website. And today we're talking about our newest classroom activity, which is evolutionary trees. Uh, so we'll be releasing complete classroom materials for this activity early next year. But in the spirit of prototyping, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback on this activity if you use it in your classroom to help us learn from what you're doing. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, let's dive in on today's activity. Oh, and I will also note that Allison will send out a draft version of the educator guide um, to you at some point in the next week or so. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about evolutionary trees, um, otherwise known, of course, as phylogenetic trees. Um, they're a way to organize species into different, different groups. Um, you create a phylogenetic tree by comparing different species and grouping them based on how related they are to each other. So closely related species would get placed in close proximity, while more distant relatives would be placed farther apart on a phylogenetic tree. 
So if you look at the tree on the top right of the screen, you can see how several different species of lizards are related to each other. So two different species of anole lizards are quite close relatives, and so they're placed together at the bottom of that tree. They're related to Komodo dragons, but it's a much more distant relationship. So Komodo dragons are placed much farther away on the tree from the anole lizards. And then on the bottom right, you can see a very different type of phylogenetic tree. This one actually shows a single species, um, the virus responsible for COVID-19. On this particular version of a phylogenetic tree, each circle represents a different DNA sequence um, that have slight differences due to mutations. And the length of the lines connecting them correspond to how similar those different strains are. Then this particular uh, graph is color coded by where the sample was from. So by comparing where different versions of the virus are found, scientists and doctors can better understand how it's spread around the world. And overall, analyzing phylogenetic trees can help you figure out how species evolved, possibly how they moved around the world um, and their evolutionary history. So this is the concept we're gonna mostly be exploring today. Uh, so this activity allows your students to apply these concepts while also exploring patterns of data creation and organization. Um, students get to do this by organizing their species into phylogenetic trees to determine how those species evolved. The activity has three main parts. Uh, first, evolving your tree. So your students are creating an evolutionary tree uh, by creating mutations in animals, in a population of animals in progressive generations. Then solving a tree, you get to swap your, uh, your final uh, species from your tree with another group um, and use the data generated to solve a tree using just what you can observe, similar to how a lot of scientists are working. And then some tree challenges, which are some more complex puzzles for your students to solve at their own pace or ability level, whatever's appropriate for your classroom. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, Abby and I are going to do a demo of the first two parts of the activity, evolving and then solving a fairly simple tree. And then we'll set you guys up to be able to solve some trees after we're done. So uh, with the evolve portion, uh, your students get to start out by evolving a tree of their own. This helps them understand the rules of the phylogenetic tree or of their evolutionary trees and the logic involved as a way to help support later problem solving. So you can see on the side, not sure which side you can see it on, uh, is an image of an evolutionary tree. This again is a fairly simple one. Uh, it has four generations, the two offspring populations at each generation. Um, this uh, tree has fewer possible solutions than some other tree types, uh, which also makes the next part, so the solving portion of the activity, easier for students to approach. Um, and so uh, the rules for evolving the tree are fairly straightforward um, at each fork. Uh, the original population splits into two species. One of those species is identical to the parent population, so it has no changes. And the other species has a mutation in one of its characteristics, which shows up as just a color change. Um, which characteristic of the new species that mutates is determined just by a roll of the dice this helps to keep the changes in your populations random, just like what you'd find in real genetic mutations where a lot of things can are mostly determined at random. Um, and you repeat that process as you move through each fork of the tree till you end up with four separate species at the bottom. Uh, if you're doing this in your classroom, you can either have students evolve their own trees or if you've got maybe less advanced students, um, you, can have, you can just move step by step through each fork as a class and kind of guide kids through the process to getting their four separate species. So for today's demo, Abby is going to evolve the tree and I'm gonna solve it. Uh, so I will turn off my volume so that I can't hear what you're doing as you evolve the tree. Go for it, Abby. All right, now that Caitlin is gone, we can get started. And um, so I'm gonna start at the top of the tree with the first fork. So at the very first fork, I need to decide which of the two new child populations will be identical as the parent. So I'm arbitrarily gonna choose the left branch to stay the same and for the right side to get a mutation. So I'm gonna add that label of the left branch getting no change. So as Caitlin mentioned, all of these mutations are going to be determined randomly. So I'm going to roll a die to see what mutation the right population gets. In this case, I rolled a one. So it looks like that means that there is a mutation in the body of my chicken species on the right. So I'm gonna make that orange and color it in. So next I have another fork and I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. I'm gonna choose, in this case, I'll go again with the left side to be the same as the parent population. 
So it gets no change. And I'll roll another die to see what the right population has as its change. In this case, it gets a mutation in the wing. So I'm gonna add a label there, gonna make it green, because why not? And then color in both new populations. So both the one that didn't inherit a change and the one that did. And then one last fork, do exactly the same thing, just because I seem to like doing the left side. I'm gonna make the left side have no change. The left population will be identical to the parent while the right population gets one mutation. I rolled a four. So this means it's going to have a change or mutation in its feet. And I'll make those yellow and color in both new populations. Okay, so I have my four new slight variations of chickens or my four populations. Um, and so the next thing I'm gonna do is copy all of them onto the uh, duplicate row at the bottom, which we're gonna call species squares. So these are the four different species of chickens that Caitlin is going to use to figure out their evolutionary history. If you were doing this in paper, you would of course have your students cut them out. So I'm gonna virtually cut them out and then shuffle them so that when I pass them over to Caitlin, she can't figure out what their order is just based on how I handed them over to her. So then I would give Caitlin her cut out species squares and she would also get a blank tree. Um, it could be printed on the back side of the original one or on a different sheet. And this is what she's gonna use to get started. So let's see if I can get Caitlin's attention and bring her back over. Caitlin, Caitlin, come back. Maybe. Okay, one sec. I hate my video to turn back on. There we go. All right. Okay. Cool. So um, I like the simple. I like the simpler trees because they are at least usually fairly straightforward to solve. Um, so let's see. I like to solve these trees by making groups of the species and then kind of narrowing down from there, looking for patterns uh, and trying to break them up from into larger groups into smaller groups. Uh, so uh, I wish. Mm, let's see. It looks like I've got three chickens with orange bodies, so they're probably form a group. Um, uh, yep. So, uh, hmm. So the population, let's see, looking at the trees, so I have a group of three species, which makes me think that that's the first mutation made in that first fork. Um, which would suggest that the population on the right has a mutation to an orange body, uh, which then since each at each fork, you only have a mutation in one side, the population on the left of that first fork probably didn't have any changes. So we'll move, uh, we'll sign my non-colored chicken down to the left of the first fork. Um, and then we'll color in the mutation since it's clearly, hopefully an orange body that happened there. Uh, and then, uh, okay. So now I've got my three ch chickens left. Um, I can make another group out of these species because there's green wings in two of them. Uh, so let's separate those two out. And then looking at the tree, it looks like this is probably actually the same situation as at the last fork where the mutation on the population on the right received a mutation and the population on the left uh, did not. So yeah, we'll mark the right-hand side with the green wing mutation since that's what the characteristic that I made my group out of. And then assign my orange body only chicken to the left-hand side of the fork. Um, this leaves me with two chicken, oh wait, I forgot, I gotta color in my, uh, color in my mutations. Now this leaves me with two spots. Um, I don't really have any extra information to tell me what order or which species they land in, so we'll just drag them back in and assign them to the last two spots on the tree, uh, marking where the mutation or no mutation is left, because I don't really have anything else to go on other than that they both ideally go there. Um, so Abby, how'd I do? Let's compare. I get Let's right. Let's compare and see what they look like. So I have your tree on the left and mine on the right. So let's just go through the four new species and see where they line up or don't line up. So the first one is the same. You put chicken number one in the first spot, which is what I had as well. Second one you had in the same spot as me too. Uh, but it looks like number three and four were in a slightly different order, so our trees aren't exactly the same. 
No, but the relationships are the same. Like three and four have the same parent population in my tree as they have in yours. The labels are, you know, they're the same. They're just in a different order. Yep, that is absolutely correct. Logic that you used in the tree is the same as mine, just slightly rearranged. Um, so I will note that this is something that you'll see quite a lot when people are solving these for real, is that if you are familiar with phylogenetic trees, you can rotate things around in different orders. So these are both perfectly valid solutions and show exactly the same information, um, just slightly rearranged. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. Um, okay, so now that we've solved our chicken tree, we can move on. So once your students have solved their first set of trees, you can set them loose to solve any of 10 other puzzles that we've developed that have different trees to solve. Uh, some of the, these trees are a lot more complex with more generations and of uh, populations of animals and a lot more possible solutions. Um, we found in a lot of our testing that it really helped to start with something simple uh, to kind of uh, guide people into the problem solving process and then expand farther out from there. Uh, so now it is your turn to do some problem solving. Uh, we'll be solving one of our more complex trees uh, today. So we've set up a separate slide deck for you to use to solve your trees. I will share the link uh, in the chat. Doesn't want to drop in. Uh, and what you'll find when you get there, you can also type it in in... Uh, uh, this, uh, so, oh, we have a question asking if this is available digitally for distance learning. We've put together a slide deck for you guys to try out today. Um, it's an option. You could try using something similar with your students if you're trying to do this activity distance. Um, it would definitely want to, uh, oh, thank you, Abby, uh, for dropping, uh, there's two versions of the link in the chat. Uh, it's definitely something you probably want to customize to your classroom. This is something we put together for today's webinar. Uh, so you'll find that you actually all, your names, I think I think I got everybody, everybody's already assigned a slide. Uh, so you can go through and find the slide with your name on it. Um, on each slide, there's a tree for you to solve. Um, and at the top, a, a line of species squares. Those are the squares that you're gonna get to use to solve. You can drag them around the tree if you want. Um, there are lines uh, and places for you to mark any of the changes if you wanna keep track as you're going um, and uh, have fun solving. It's up to uh, you guys to see if you can determine what the relationships are between the dragonflies. If you have any questions, please feel free, drop them in the chat uh, and let us know. Uh, while you're solving, uh, we do have some tips to help you out along the way. Um, you'll wanna keep in mind that the rules from the evolved tree that we just did uh, still apply here. At each fork, only one population changes and only one trait changes in each species at a time. Um, and it really helps to try and look for patterns between your species to see if you can see any relationships. So we'll give you like five minutes or so to work on your tree on your own. Um, feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat or let us know in the chat when you're done. Um, and we're here to help you uh, while you're solving your trees, answer any questions about um, how this might work um, and things like that. So while we're waiting. Abby, you're a geneticist. I am not a yeah. geneticist, as much of a geneticist by training. Have you ever use uh, evolutionary trees uh, in your research? Yes. Uh, my own PhD actually was in evolutionary genetics, so I used phylogenetic trees quite a lot. Um, they were a really common tool that we would use. I studied fish evolution, so I would look at how different um, species and populations of fish were related to each other. I um, also would often just make them of mammals in general so that it would help me keep my, keep my DNA sequences in order. Um, those trees were always based on DNA sequences while the trees we're doing here are based on morphology and appearance. Um, but the idea there is definitely the same. Yeah. Also had some nice phylogenetic trees hanging over my desk as inspiration with some nice cool whale fossils. I have many questions. Uh, why fossils? So um, fossils are cool 
first off, anyone who's ever studied science knows that fossils are cool. Um, but also I studied for my PhD um, hind limb reduction. So I was interested in how limbs develop and how they might be lost. So whales are a very good example of hind limb loss. Whales, of course, don't have legs. They have flippers instead. And so there's a really cool fossil record of the ancestor species of whales and how they've lost their limbs over time. Really nice phylogenetic tree that can be created that shows that progression of limb loss. So I liked looking at the extinct species of cetaceans above my desk. Yes. Huh. That's pretty cool. So we would also note that um, while this activity is very much an introduction to phylogenetic trees, it can touch on many different different topic areas, such as fossils and how you can learn things from the fossil record. Um, what you're doing today is based on appearance and effectively morphology, which is how you would um, group fossils and compare them to modern species as well. We also had a question earlier on about um, current events and how you can connect phylogenetic trees to things like COVID-19 and how they are useful useful today. I don't know, Caitlin, if you want to talk some about phylogenetics and pandemics and how those work. I don't, I've always found it really interesting um, trying to understand how uh, epidemiologists can track the spread of diseases, especially like emerging infectious diseases, um, and see how they move. Um, I know the COVID tree that you had earlier in the beginning uh, is a great way to kind of visualize, well, maybe not always entirely accurate, especially as a uh, uh, disease is first spreading and we're first learning a lot about something that's like really novel, um, but it can be a really interesting way to see how things have moved and get a better understanding of how uh, by tracking the mutations in a disease as it spreads from person to person, because you will see mutations happen over time, uh, using that as a way to take a look at how that can spread around different people is always pretty cool. There's always, of course, step one in any new emerging disease is just the basic question of where did it even come from? Um, so that everyone talked a lot about that um, early on in the coronavirus pandemic of where did this come from? How did it um, become part of, you know, our, our own issues? How did it become a disease that affects humans? And comparing it to other coronaviruses that are similar and trying to figure out what species it might've come from um, was very much an early thing to try to help figure out the source and then try to contain you know, this coronavirus. Yeah, and uh, epidemiologists will use it for other things too, not just like viruses. You also see a lot of these getting formed um, in uh, for like things like bacterial infections. Um, I've seen some really cool ones uh, that are looking at the spread of things like you know, multi and not extreme, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis and looking at like how those uh, strains spread around too, um, or understanding like what the prevalence of specific strains are in an area uh, where you can kind of look at every, take a ton of samples, look and see what's there and look to see whether you've got a whole lot of one thing or a lot of many different things, uh, which can also be really fascinating to look at. That's one way that in um, COVID-19, they've been able to estimate that super spreaders are responsible for a lot of the infections because you can see that there is high repetition of the same strains as opposed to a lot of different ones, which indicate that they all have common sources. Um, it's one of the genetic indications that you have very high spreading events. Always fine to find something that like can be applied to something very, very old, like your uh, cetacean uh, limb, hind limb loss and uh, something that's like super relevant, um, like a global pandemic. I'll give everybody another couple of minutes to keep solving their tree. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We're happy to answer them.
it is fun to watch the trees take form. Mm -hmm. I've also found it interesting in all of our different prototyping sessions, how different people approach this problem solving. Um, there's a lot of different strategies that people take. You saw when Caitlin was solving um, her chicken tree that she was looking at colors that were similar across many of them and grouping them to find the ones that were um, different and then matching that back on to how the tree is shaped. Um, but other people have different strategies. I've heard of um, a couple, I think Caitlin, you watched someone's very different problem solving strategy in prototyping. I did. I watched um, uh, somebody was uh, going through and testing and kind of like their move was to count the number of colors on the final one and then go back through and look at the tree and see how many like how many uh, generations from that first population that one would have been, which was not an approach I'd ever considered and would definitely require you to know what the tree was shaped like uh, before you started, um, which especially if you're putting one together. You don't usually know what the tree is shaped like. You kind of have to work from just what you can find that is similar. But uh, it is an approach. In the version that we've pulled together, we have five, um, five animal puzzles that are much like this one, where you have a blank tree and many species squares to try to arrange them. We also have five that don't have the blank tree that require you to recreate the structure without knowing it, which is much more how you would actually create a phylogenetic tree. You know, when you're actually going out and studying species, you don't have the you know, history of it that you're just trying to plug into. But we found that providing a scaffold like this really creates this lower bar to entry, where if you have some success with this, it becomes easier to figure out the strategies that you might use and then apply it to a harder problem, like solving one without the existing structure. You can of course try this for advanced classes where you can just not give them the blank trees if you want to challenge them even more or reinforce um, how phylogenetic trees would get created from species data. There are a ton of different ways that you can like either increase the complexity of this activity or decrease the complexity depending on uh, what your the needs of your classroom and the level that your students are at too. I do at least appreciate that these trees are all sort of in a line and not the circular ones like the COVID one you showed. Those have always made my brain hurt. I realize that they're really great for showing clusters in particular. It's a great way to like visualize that data and take a look at it um, and a useful way for organization, but it still always makes my brain hurt a little bit. I agree. I find the circles plots more challenging. Um, in general. I did look at some of the COVID phylogenetic trees that were available that were in the traditional um, branching line shape and they just have so many different entries. They'd have, you know, 100 or 200 different strains that it just becomes teeny tiny little black lines that you're staring at. Um, but they do come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and depending on what type of information you want out of it, um, different ones may be useful in different situations. That's one way you can also challenge more advanced students is once you've created a phylogenetic tree of this more traditional um, shape, if you can challenge them to draw it again in a totally different shape that shows the same information, the same relationships, just differently. It's a good way to get you thinking critically about uh, some of the changes that you made and uh, some of the, I guess, some of the decisions and analyses that you made.
is fun to watch how everyone is approaching uh, just solving their tree. Uh, one of the barriers we've run into as we've been testing out this activity is like this activity runs very smoothly and very easily as an in-person paper-based activity where you can directly share things and have as much um, have as many copies and other things on hand as you need uh, that there are it is a little bit harder to run as a distance based solving problem solving activity distance based distance problem solving something like that it is significantly easier if you're able to cut out the different squares, move them around on a tree, easily write in labels for the tree. That's one of the easiest ways to double check your solution, um, write down your ideas. Writing in the labels helps a lot. It helps you make sure that the logic follows the original rules, helps you make sure that each fork has one branch that gets a change, one that doesn't, and that only one thing is changing at a time. Uh, much easier to do uh, on paper when you can also write down with a pencil, erase, don't have to worry about text boxes moving all around the screen. And if you're struggling at all, I highly recommend writing down labels for the branches um, as an early step. That can help a lot if you're trying around and want to see how your logic is working. Applying those labels um, even before you've finished figuring it all out can help you rule out some different possibilities and figure out um, what options are left. So uh, the tree that you guys are solving is the dragonfly tree. It is, like we said, a little bit more complex than the chicken tree, has more generations of species. We've got one, two, three, four, five generations instead of four, uh, which means that you have a whole bunch more offspring or offspring species, uh, final species, there we go, um, that are going to turn up at the end of the tree. Uh, and having more options, uh, having more, sorry, a larger number of different populations to have to assign and identify relationships together, the, identify the relationships between them uh, can definitely dramatically increase the complexity of the problem solving. I will also say that we've done you a bit of a disservice today and just giving you the diving straight into the harder ones. It's significantly easier when you start with the, the small one and you think about how you would approach this problem in a much smaller bite-sized way. That's why we've broken this into three parts where you have this first part um, evolving and then solving and then moving on to these challenges. It really provides a lot of scaffolding and practice and something that looks really easy and is pretty easy when you're doing the chicken version. Um, and then when you dive into these bigger ones, it is, it is a step up for sure. I think we'll give everyone another minute or two, wrap up their last thoughts, and uh, then we'll see what you've come up with. And don't worry if you're not done with your tree yet. We're interested in the, th we'd love to hear from you what your thought process is too. Um, we're gonna share out some trees when we're done, see if anybody's interested in uh, talking a little bit about what they did. Um, one of the most interesting things about developing and like putting this activity together is looking at how different people approach this kind of problem solving. Um, it's been really fun, like I, to me, to me, as a the way I think this kind of problem solving comes very naturally, but I know I recognize that that doesn't happen for all people. Um, uh, the different like ways of logic and reasoning, different brains uh, follow that through different ways, and so uh, I always find it really interesting to hear how people are working. It just occurred to me now that I should have checked the sample to see if any of the ones that I randomly dragged around the screen are in the right place or in something resembling a right place. They might not be at all. I don't know. I wouldn't trust the sample. Yeah, no, I wouldn't trust it either. Never trust a sample.
Okay. So let's, um, if you are still solving, feel free to keep solving. Um, not going to take away your solving trees from you. Um, but let's, uh, let's see if anybody's interested in sharing their tree. If you are, uh, feel free to uh, just drop us a note in the chat if you're interested in sharing out uh, your tree. Um, a reminder again, we are recording this webinar. So uh, you feel free to just turn your voice on if you want. You don't have to turn your video on. Um, but would anybody be interested in sharing their tree? Abby, can you slide to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, go ahead and raise your hand. It will, uh, I think actually everybody's already promoted to panelists. They are. Everyone, you should be able to turn on your own cameras. Anybody interested in sharing, even if you didn't finish your tree, I'd be interested to hear where you were uh, in your thought process. I'll, I'll go. Awesome. Uh, here, hang on one sec. I will yeah. uh, share your, this is uh, Eliana. 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 Got it. Okay. I have hit the wrong button. Uh, feel free to start talking and I will share in just a second. Okay. Uh, so um, what, uh, I have entirely frozen my screen. Oh. That's not terribly helpful, is it? Um, Abby, any chance you can? I can do that. Thank you. Ah, well, wait, there we go. I got it. You should hopefully be able to see your tree. <laughs> Where? <laughs> uh, am I screen sharing? I am not sharing. There we go. There you go. Sorry about that, everybody. So I'll just say right away, I got stuck because I was looking at literally color patterns. And if we start out with this guy, well, I suppose if we start out with a different one, we could, if we just didn't get this one at all and started a different way. But look, um, with these um, wings not colored, okay, um, I got stuck right here. Because if we follow the pattern, you know, one carries on, carries on. Here, uh, here, let's start at the top, okay? Here's this guy. So this one um, doesn't get changed while this one gets green wings. And if we follow this one, this side doesn't get changed, but this one gets a yellow, no wing change, but has a yellow abdomen, right? Okay, no change here and comes down. So this guy's no change, but this one has orange eyes. Okay. And I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with this side over here. Um, <clears throat> Where do these, <laughs> these wigs come in? This is logical to me right here, unless we can have two mutations in a uh, generation or something like that. Not in this case. Pardon? This one, not in this case, although you could choose to make that a difference in your classroom. One mutation per generation. Okay, so if this is no change and we change this to green and there's no change here, that would have you know no color on the body parts except the green wings. Here, this one changed by adding a yellow uh, thorax. This one would have to come down here because there's no change. And down here we can have this one, there's no change. But here we've added a, a blue head. So that leaves these guys out. I don't know where to put these guys because Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Well, no, these guys don't have an orange body. So we can't put it here. It would have right. to. So yeah. it's sounding like you got stuck pretty early on. 
um, because of the green wings one. Um, I'm curious, were you then thinking of uh, green and pink wings belonging in the same side? I'm just thinking about the thought process of how you're picturing um, well, these different mutations. I think logically I would have put in one here with a um, magenta wings and a yellow body. But there's no option here for that. I mean, if I just stuck this guy in here, that would have been two mutations because it would have lost that yellow body. And that's where I'm stuck. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, um, thank I you. Definitely follow all the logic and it's good to hear um, where people are getting stuck. Would someone else like to share what their logic and thought process was on this and see if we can resolve any of the green wing confusion? Is anyone else able to put the green wings somewhere they thought made sense or any wings? Uh, so uh, I can give it a try. Swap over to your... Yeah. Oops, wait a minute. How come it looks like that? <laughs> what am I doing? Is that mine? I think so. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm looking at... <laughs> I see something different on my screen. We may be able to let you share your screen. Allison, is that something we can do? Yes, yes, yep, you yes, should be do. able to. All right. Uh, what do I do? I, uh, I usually use WebEx at school. So go down uh, to the bottom, there's a green button that says share screen. And if you click on that, it'll bring up all the windows you have on your computer and you'll click on the one that has your slides. Okay. All right, so. Uh, probably that one. Now, how come I have the yellow uh, or the uh, warning thing? I see bunches of warning signs. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, well, <laughs> interesting question. I don't think that we've ever had anyone have that issue before. This may be an insurmountable tech challenge. Would anyone else who has <laughs> a solution like to share? Sharing is going great today, guys. <laughs> If not, um, oh, uh, if, if not, we can, do we want to just, uh, oh, yeah. James, James. Uh, is... Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I can share on mine. Let's see, I will, I will, I will wait for it is shared. Here, I got you, James. All right, so I, I ran into some similar problems that were mentioned before where I was, kind of, I was going through and I was trying to figure out where the, where, kind of where the starting point was. So kind of my process for figuring out, I put all of mine on the bottom first. I kind of tried backtracking a bit and I basically kind of looked from the top, bottom up and from the top down. So like I would look through and see, okay, so like if we're just looking at the green ones on the left, uh, I was trying to determine, okay, like how could these get divided up? Because the green wings were the common trait amongst all of them. I tried um, both having to go for the tree on the right side, but, and, and it worked. I was able to get it to work similar to um, how Elena got it to work, but then I couldn't fit the purple wings in it because it just, there just wasn't enough space. So I tried swapping um, them around and I ended up trying this order where I'll talk down <laughs> from the top. So at the top, we got nothing. And then we have one that starts with green wings and one that's nothing. So then if we continue with the green wings, it goes down to the next level where you basically decide between green wings. And then I just chose one of the blue or um, the blue head or the orange body and then 
had that one split off there. And then because that continued on, then I chose to have the green wings as the solo one continue on to the bottom and then the orange buy. So this all made sense. So then the confusing one was the, um, the non-colored one, the one that didn't have any change all the way through because I couldn't just have it stick to one side because there were so many variabilities with like the yellow tail, the orange eyes, the purple wings with all the various ones that, that I guessed that it had to have somehow intermingle amongst all the rest. So you can kind of see, if I'll just focus on the one that didn't change, I had to go to the right and then drop down one, no change so I can have the eyes go off and be its own soul one. And then from there I had the, the emergence of the purple wings and then it could go off and have its own two where you have just purple wings and purple wings with feet. And then the last one where it ended up being um, no color and then the ones with the little tail. And it was, I kind of had to go through a couple of tries to figure out where they all piece together, but kind of each time I learned something and then I was able to swat these larger, um, these smaller trees into the larger tree. And um, I think this is right. Someone can check me if I'm wrong, but yeah. It looks good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for sharing. Um, it's really helpful to hear how your thought process goes. Um, I'm gonna share another possible solution. So I'm gonna switch slides for a moment and show you one other option. As with many uh, phylogenetic trees, there are many possible solutions. So there isn't just one um, possibility, there are several. So I'm gonna walk you through how you might compare different trees to um, see how they go. So this is one solution. This is the solution I came up with before, um, before starting this webinar today. Um, and this looks quite similar to the one that James showed. So it's a lot easier to follow if you have the labels. I would strongly encourage when you're running this with students to like make sure they label all the different parts, which helps you understand what the logic of it is. When I look at this particular tree, um, looking at just the bottom, the bottom row, the species squares for a moment, what I notice immediately is that three of them have green wings. So this is also what Yelena was um, latching on to pretty fast. So the most common feature among them is green wings, where we have three that have green wings and the rest do not. So then if you look at the structure of the tree and you look at how it's divided, that first fork at the very top um, ends up on the left-hand side, there are three. And then on the right-hand side, there are five. So if you have a group of three, you can maybe guess that it's going to go on that left-hand side of the tree because that's the only place where you have three dragonflies that group together. So based on that, that's the first fork that I filled in on this one is I decided that since there were three with green wings and there are three boxes on the left, that first fork has to be green wings on the left. So that helped quite a lot once I had that first decision point. I could write in green wings at the top and then I would know that the right fork must not have had a change because that was the rule for how these trees are evolved. So only one side can get a change and one side does not. So based on that type of logic, I was able to fill in the rest of it here. Uh, but there are many solutions. If you are paying close attention, you might have noticed that James's solution looked different than this one. He did not have them in exactly the same order, but we all looked at his tree and the logic made sense. And we agreed that all of his different dragonflies worked in those positions. So how can that be true? Um, and this is where we really want to embrace this idea of multiple correct answers. And there's a couple of different ways to get to that, um, which makes this a little bit difficult to grade, but I'm gonna show you a couple ways you can look through your trees and see um, how they work. The first thing is, of course, to look at the labels and make sure that the logic is correct. So if you're looking at it and you notice that, you know, uh, the left branch got a mutation and the right branch got a mutation, it's probably not a correct tree because it didn't follow the right rules. Um, but aside from that, there's a few things you can look for. So it's really common in these types of trees to have rearrangements. Um, so a lot of these things can get switched around in the order without affecting the logic. So a tree is rearranged when all of the species relationships are the same. So if species have the same parent species, um, they are siblings. And that's true no matter what order you write them in. So if you look at this uh, tiny tree on the top that has A, B, C, um, lines of course connect ones that are closely related. In that left-hand side, you can see B and C are closely related. They share a parent and A is their cousin. And if you look on the tree on the right, they're written in a different order. They're written A, C, B. 
But B and C in that one are still siblings, even though they're written in a different order. So even though these two trees look slightly different, they contain the same information, just rearranged. And this is really, really common. There is no right way to write these. You can put them in either order. There isn't one that's correct or one that's wrong. So this is a very easy way to have trees that look different. Um, but there's a different way you can have different trees and they could truly have different logic and different, um, different thought processes. And this is actually something we saw on the James's tree that looked different from mine. So in this type of tree, the relationships between the species are different. So a pair of sibling, a pair of uh, species may be siblings in one tree, but more distant relatives in the other. So in this case, um, in that little tree on the top, on the left-hand side, B and C are siblings, they share a parent, but on the right-hand side, B and C are cousins, they do not share a parent. These two trees are not the same. They do not show the same type of information. They show different types of relationships and they are different trees. Um, but because they're different doesn't necessarily mean one is right or wrong. So always be sure to check the logic of the different trees. So what this looks like in our dragonfly example, I know that it gets really small on this, sorry for this, we'll share out the slides later so you can make it a little bit bigger. The left-hand side is that tree that I showed you, my solution from the original one. And what you can see there is, you can see all the different relationships of the dragonflies. The one in the middle shows the same types of relationships as my tree, it's just rearranged. So what you can see here is that the pink ones, D and F um, in that first tree are on that uh, left-hand side. They're in those um, two second to last positions. But in the middle tree, they've been switched around. And that's because there are different ways you can arrange this information, different ways to show it. They still show the same relationships though. Um, so you can rotate them around some different branches. So where I've shown um, the blue arrows are where you can rearrange these different, these different trees and where the positions are a little bit different. Um, so in this case, you can see that F and D are siblings in both my tree and that middle tree, even if they're put in different places. Not only are they siblings, but they are cousins to the other dragonflies, G and E. Um, and that's true in both trees, even though they're written in slightly different orders. On the other hand, you can have a tree like the one on the right, which has a different type of relationship. So if you look at the green dragonflies in this one, um, they're written in a different order and they actually have different relationships. So in my tree, I said that C and H, the green wings with the orange body and just the green wings, I said they were siblings um, and that logically could make sense. But on the tree on the far right hand side, um, this has C and A as cousins instead of siblings. And that's also totally fine. This makes logical sense with how the decisions are made in the tree. Um, James has actually had a totally different solution that isn't shown here. Um, he had E and F flipped around. So the one with the red eyes and the one with the yellow thorax in his tree were switched positions. And that's fine. It was a logically consistent tree. All of the um, decisions that he made made sense. We checked his tree. His logic was sound, just ended up with a different solution. Um, so that's something you're going to see in, in these types of trees. This is something that's true in um, phylogenetics um, as a whole. There are lots of different ways to write these trees. And sometimes you might have uh, two competing answers that show different types of information. And you don't know which one is correct. They're both from the information you have. Either one could make sense. And that's something you see in real life as well, where sometimes you have an ambiguous situation where your data could su support option one, or it could support option two. And either one from the data you have uh, would make sense. Um, and you might have to collect more data in order to figure out which one is more correct. But in this case, you're gonna have multiple, multiple solutions. And that's really the core concept that we want to drive home in this particular activity is this idea of ambiguity, being able to have many different uh, possible solutions, multiple correct answers, and how this is something pretty common in science. Um, at least um, doing research in science. It's quite common to have ambiguous things, um, but it's not often a thing that you see in classroom activities. This can okay. also be a great way to get your students thinking a little bit more critically about what their problem solving process is. Uh, and uh, even if a different group gets a different answer, uh, getting your students to reason and um, defend what their choices are is a great addition. Uh, to your standard phylogenetics tree activity. Um, so uh, for those of you who are thinking about including something like this in your classroom, uh, you can absolutely, like we were talking about before, introduce this activity at a variety of different levels of complexity, uh, either working with beginning scientists in a simpler form by moving step-by-step through a tree or uh, using more and more complex trees um, or having your students even evolve and solve 
not using a chicken tree, but instead using um, one of the other more complex species trees. There's a ton of ways that you can layer in more complex puzzles uh, or provide more scaffolding uh, for students um, to solve some of the puzzles, really just to match your classroom. because You know best what uh, will work best with your students. Um, so we talked uh, while you guys were solving at whether or not you're paying attention, <laughs> Um, uh, Abby and I were chattering a little bit about um, some of the different ways that you can easily apply this activity across a number of grades um, and different topic areas that you can apply it to uh, from your fairly simple, um, uh, you know, understanding how different organisms uh, relate to each other uh, in younger grades, particularly before you ever bring in the concepts of like mutations, just understanding that different organisms may or may not have, it may resemble other things, uh, all the way from that to, you know, talking about incorporating things about the fossil record up to a really in-depth exploration of, uh, of uh, variation and distribution of traits in a population. So you can really layer in your content around this core activity. So especially if you're thinking about how can you readdress a topic over time, if you're a middle or high school teacher uh, who's also trying to uh, set up, have your students set up a little bit better coming out of primary school, um, you could take this activity and really kind of either scale it up or scale it down um, so that you're revisiting that at more complex topics at later grades. Um, we ran into a few of the uh, limitations of doing this as a distance activity today. Um, and you can still adapt this activity to a distance classroom if you need to, whether you're you know, distributing like low tech paper options, which would be great, especially if your students um, have limited uh, connectivity to the internet, they can uh, like work their way through uh, these problems uh, asynchronously up to having your students work together in groups while they're problem solving, having somebody to bounce ideas off of. Uh, we recommend really that you have students doing the problem solving in pairs at minimum throughout the process. That way you have somebody else to bounce ideas off of and think things through uh, but for today, we made you all do your problem solving on your own. Uh, so I think with that, that's about it for us. I know we are pretty much at the time. Uh, we would love your feedback for those of you who have attended. Um, there is a link on the screen and we can uh, drop it in the chat as well. Um, and so with that, thank you all so much for joining us. Does anybody have any more questions? I wrote that wrong. We'll share out the link in the chat. Um, we also have other resources available through the tech. So there are educator resources, parent guides and videos, there's um, Spanish guides and videos, and some tips on adapting design challenge learning for distance learning. We'll share out the slide deck later so you can have all of these different links. And there are several different biotinkering lab specific resources as well um, around four different activities. So Making with Microbes has an at home activity guide that you could adapt to your own classrooms as does Cabbage Inc. Um, Algae String has an actual classroom version that was released last month. Um, and Evolutionary Trees is brand new. Today is the um, first day it's been released at all. So the full version of that will be coming probably in February or so. Um, so if you are interested in using this in your classrooms, do let us know and let us know how it goes. This is very much a work in progress and uh, we would welcome any feedback on how, how it's um, being used in your classrooms. I think the next webinar that the tech has is building empathy through narratives, which will be on December 8th. Um, and you can register for it um, on the text educator website. So with that, we're gonna stick around and answer any additional questions that people have, whether on the evolutionary trees activity um, or any other topics that we covered today. So thank you all for your time. Um, we really appreciate having all of you here today. I'm gonna go ahead and pause.